Hi, boys and girls. Um, I've got a little something for you to have a look at. Uh, this is a, uh, a speech that I did for a bunch of um, investors. What we thought we'd do is just cut it up and let you have a look. It's a little bit of an anthology from uh, the early days of why cars went to gasoline versus EV. I think, though, that my audience uh, will have a good time watching it. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, tip those cashiers and um, have fun. Thanks so much. Bye. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. So let's have a look at uh, a historic crystal ball. The past to me has always proven to be the crystal ball that we need to see what the future is going to look like. So if we look back in the past, um, there was a horse pollution crisis. And uh, the horse pollution crisis um, basically was written up by the folks in the uh, London Times as, uh, in 50 years, every street in London will be buried under nine feet of manure. Now, mm, maybe they wouldn't clean it up, but that seems like a little bit of an exaggeration to me. But at the end of the day, it was a big deal. And so, for Evie's and Ice, the, the race was on. What we needed to do was figure out how to get rid of horses and move into something that didn't have horse pollution. So you've got the EVs over there with a, with a Baker Electric, and on the right-hand side, you've got the Model T Ford, and basically it was buy electric and, uh, and end pollution, or buy a Ford and stop horse pollution. So we look at the, uh, at the EV market in those days, those early days, and you see these little postcards and whatnot. And, uh, <laughs> And one of the ones that I liked the best was uh, from the lady that wrote that little postcard there on your left. And it says, you know, we have that big touring car, but I can drive this myself. And I learned to drive it in an hour. That was what the big attraction was for the, for the electric vehicle prior, prior to Boss Kettering. And if we look at what Boss Kettering did, he invented basically the electric starter. And that made it so that a woman didn't have to go out, and, or even a man, it didn't have to go out with a crank and start the car. Boss Kettering was a genius, um, one of my favorite geniuses. And Henry Ford, Henry Ford was the same thing. He installed the first moving assembly line, and now everything changed. That was called a paradigm shift. From where it was to where it needed to be was a, was a watershed. So now let's talk about these historic people. So let's talk about... Charles Kettering. Um, he was the inventor, as I said, of the electric starter, but he had another 186 patents that he, he developed, including fast drying paint, leaded gasoline, Freon, the first aerial missile. His philosophy was, uh, was to live in the future. He didn't, uh, he didn't care about what happened in the past, and he didn't really care that much about what was going on in the day that he was living. He was, he was basically looking at the future. The learned of his time considered him an ass. He, wasn't, he didn't have social graces like, um, like some of the folks in New York. Henry Ford, uh, he, was, um, he was a little bit of a, um, a handful as well. But he borrowed a technique he'd observed in a Chicago slaughterhouse. And that is, in essence, where the modern day assembly line came from. It wasn't, an, it wasn't a really popular idea at its inception, but he pursued what he believed in. Many skeptics were left in his wake. Now, we're moving into the ice age, the, the domination of the, uh, of the internal combustion engine. And so, basically, the, the, the word of mouth was, step on the gas and take the whole family. So, um, with Ford, it was um, kind of like, buy a Ford because it's the frugal way of getting around. In, uh, in those days, people weren't cheap, they were frugal. Cheap to them meant that you were buying junk that didn't last. So Henry Ford's idea of frugality was the, was the right way to do it. And then, of course, how do I get those women out of those electric vehicles? Easy. It's so easy to start, even a woman can do it. So consequently, electric vehicles pretty much died out, and they died out really quickly. Now, let's fast forward to 2020, and let's look at the paradigm shift here. Hmm. Anybody see any similarities? What about that guy on the left? Does he, um, is he Mr. Popular all the time? What about all those little things that he's come up with? Hmm. How about this area right here? How about that guy on the right-hand side? But still, there are skeptics. There's a lot of people that say, oh, well, 
Who cares about that? But if you look, if you look at what he's doing, if you look at all of the things that these two guys are doing, the skateboard, the, the different Tesla vehicles, th these are the guys who are leading the parade. They're the innovators that are changing the world. And so I focused most of my attention on these two, uh, these two people. So let's see who makes money on EVs. Well, nobody there. No one, none of those guys are making money on EVs. So let's have a look at Volkswagen and Tesla. Volkswagen, maybe soon. I think that uh, of all of the different uh, companies out there that could possibly make money, I believe it's going to be Volkswagen. And then Tesla, well, five profitable quarters. By the time this gets to you, um, because I'm recording it early, by the time it gets to you, I'm sure that uh, Tesla stock is going to go to the moon. A while ago, I predicted that uh, Tesla stock would go to $1,500. And everybody at the radio station or TV station that I was at started laughing. They thought it was impossible. Okay, so let's look at the uh, attributes associated with the future in EVs. So what are the factors? Well, there's certainly the economical ones. And then there's the environmental ones. And then there's the social ones and the political ones. And this can go on and on. But let's talk to these things um, um, based on, on the area that they're, uh, they're associated with. So... The European and the Chinese and, uh, and basically all the other Asian, Asian companies, they're mandating changes to EVs. I mean, people have to move to EVs. They, they can't stay where they are. They must move into a new way of getting from point A to P, point B. The social trend among the general population, and this is not just the young, but the social trend among the general population is pushing for EVs. I have had dozens of people come in here talking about how they love their, their EV, uh, whether it's a Prius or, or a Tesla or a whatever, it doesn't matter. They like the fact that they're not polluting the planet. These people are not young. These people that are coming to visit are in their 60s and 70s, and they're happy as a clam to be involved with something that's, being, that's good for the planet, at least in their eyes. And then the last thing is single ownership of vehicles is tending downward in favor of alternative patterns, including things like leasing, renting, and transportation as a service, all of which bodes well for EVs. So let's go in here a little bit deeper. So how are EVs going to survive? Well, um, I can tell you for sure that when we were in 2018, Monroe calculated the price for the Tesla Model 3, and that pack was... $136 per kilowatt hour. The price for the Model Y that we just finished is $108 per kilowatt hour. That's a significant drop. The, the, the big number that everybody has been looking at is the price of EVs, even though they're still higher than ICE vehicles, but at $100 per kilowatt hour, uh, they're on par. We believe, I believe, that the cost of EVs will decrease rapidly over the next 10 years. And the reason for that, it's going to be due to innovation and economy of scales. So let's have a look at some of the things that have gone down quickly. So IGBTs and MOSFETs, uh, there's also sophisticated ICs that, uh, that, are, that are going into place. Those prices are dropping exponentially. There's new battery technology on the way, which will significantly drop the price, of the, um, of the high voltage battery pack, and I'll show you some examples of that in a bit. Let's look at innovation. So if we look at, again, Tesla, I, it's hard for me to get away from them because they are leading the parade. These are the things that really and truly can make a significant difference to the cost associated with running your EV. We're looking at nothing, nothing, but uh, nothing short of advancement after advancement after advancement. Now. I, I think it's also important to discuss how quickly Tesla is moving, the speed of thought, because that's kind of what we're looking at with, uh, with Tesla. This is a manifold that you're looking at right now. This manifold came to us from one of, the, one of our customers because they still had, they brought a brand new Tesla and they, they, they wanted us to see what was going on inside of it. And we were shocked when we found out that there's been 13 
change notices, change, changes to the design since when we bought ours in, um, in uh, April, or March, I should say. That doesn't happen. There are, there are board of reviews, there's, a, there's a, a change board that you have to go through, there's all kinds of paraphernalia. Nobody I've ever heard of could make 13 changes in, in, in less, than, less than three months. This is like staggering, how do they do that? I think they do it because their heritage is not looking at model years and, and they don't care about, uh, they don't seem to care about pride and stuff like that. If there's something new or good or right, they want to make that difference. One of the people that I quote often is Martin Luther King, and he, he said, the time is right to always do what's right. And that seems to be the philosophy at, um, that seems to be the philosophy at Tesla. So let's look at something else that they've changed. So if we look over here, we can show you, this is what the existing, or sorry, the Model 3 um, induction motor had, copper. It was copper with steel laminates. These are laminates. But we just tore apart the Model Y. And what they did was, they've changed. They changed it from copper to aluminum. So this is now a cast in place aluminum induction motor. That drops the price significantly. This is a huge savings, huge. I cannot believe that Tesla could move so quickly as to make that kind of a difference. Tesla is big on bold investments. Let me, let me show you one right here. This mega casting, when we started taking it apart and uh, started taking apart the, uh, the, the Model Y, when we saw this, I was totally blown away. This is an amazing accomplishment, amazing. <laughs> the, the amount of money that you'd have to spend to put this thing in place is what usually kills it. And by the way, Monroe has suggested this to our customers multiple times and they all came back either they started laughing or they came back and said no way we'll never get a return on investment so if you think that's good how about this this is an even bolder investment they're now going to do the whole rear end in one piece and they're also going to make the front in one piece so the front of dash and the rear it's going to be one gigantic casting each. So two gigantic castings, probably surrounded by, by sheet metal. <laughs> Who does that kind of stuff? Those are the kind of innovations that basically will leave everyone else totally in the dust. And I believe that things are going to be changing so rapidly in the near future that, that, uh, that battery weight and battery cost is going to drop like a rock. And anybody who's not looking at vertical integration or moving beyond their um, core competencies is probably going to be left in the dust. And that's a fact. So we are also looking at things that Tesla is saying about, um, about what they want to do for their, uh, for their friends or maybe their enemies uh, down the road. And Tesla said it's open to licensing software and supplying powertrains and batteries. This is a fabulous way to subjugate your enemies. If they have to buy your, 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 your motors and your batteries and your software, uh, how can they possibly make any profit? This is the kind of thing that Tesla's thinking, and if, you, if you're just following what the, uh, what the folks said, um, at uh, Wall Street say, it, oh, great idea. But if you think about Sun Tzu, this is a way to get rid of enemy's ability to manufacture anything on their own. There's no way that you can compete if you're buying it from somebody else. You have no way to innovate. So, what about ICE? Okay, so at the end of the day, popular opinion is going against uh, ICE. Inversely, the cost of an ICE is, um, is increasingly mostly due to government regulations, mandates, and public scrutiny. The public just wants to get rid of them. The worst, um, the worst could be the de-escalation of economies of scale that, that have to do with ice production. So if you're trying to produce things on three shifts and seven days a week, and suddenly you go down to five days a week and uh, one shift, uh, the cost is going to go up. And there's no question about that. And that's what I see coming about 
slowly, but, uh, but in 10 years, it's going to be quite a, quite a struggle for anybody that's trying to produce ice engines or ice transmissions. Engine transmission plants require lots of workers for assembly. They're not cost effective on a, in a one shift world. And the price of gasoline is going up and will continue to increase because of the diminishing demand. Right? When, there's, uh, when there's less and less people buying gasoline, the price of gasoline is gonna go up. And then on top of that, the price is also gonna have to increase because most road taxes come from the price of gasoline. And you need gasoline um, in order, to, uh, in order to, uh, to make those taxes uh, fill the gap. So what's gonna wind up happening, I believe, is that um, gasoline prices are gonna go to the moon and somehow governments will have to figure out a new way of taxing people so they can fix the roads. So the OEMs have, uh, the bigger OEMs have already been working to bring their own EV products to market. Um, so they, they're trying to compete, but is it too little too late? So let's have a look at uh, the first EV I ever worked on, which was for GM, the EV1. They hired Monroe um, in the early 1990s, I think it was 1990, and uh, when we analyzed that thing and helped them um, hit their targets, we got every target except for one, the range. And the reason for that was the lead-acid batteries that they chose to use. Now, lead-acid batteries um, uh, were manufactured by GM and they thought, well, we'll, we'll do that as well. But they, they didn't, what they didn't think of was what kind of range are you gonna get out of these things and how reliable are they and on and on and on. So the EV1, we hit the target of weight, we hit the target of cost, we hit everything, but without, uh, without lithium ion batteries, it was doomed from the get-go. The, uh, the other big OEMs, the ones in Europe, um, we've done comparisons with them. And as you can see, um, Tesla winds up with all the green boxes um, when it comes to engine power, uh, when it comes to acceleration and range, top speed and towing capacity, um, Tesla Model Y takes it all. Let's have a look at worldwide. So now we're looking at the Audi, the BMW, the Jag, the Kia, the Nissan, the, the Tesla, and, and we're looking at the averages. And again, you can see that Audi wins in the two areas that they're the best at. The reason that it's hard to talk about anybody else is because the market is so dominated by Tesla. I don't know what everyone else is doing, but to me, this would be the company to benchmark. This would be the company to emulate. This would be the one that I would want to try and, and beat somehow, or at least come up with something that's going to be similar. Because if you're playing the game, and you're playing one set of rules, and somebody else is playing a different set of rules, you are definitely going to lose. So let's have a look at how big that uh, disparity is. So now we're looking at China sales, and this is year to date, June of 2020, and we're looking at BYD, GAC, SAIC, and then uh, the BMW. Uh, that, that's still, that's staggering the difference. Tesla is still making extra market share, but, but they've still got, they've got stuff sitting in the wings. So they've got the, they've got the Cybertruck, and they've got two more EV cars coming out, and one of them is a compact electric. I think that because of the COVID wars, the um, woes, I should say, um, the cultural changes, the young and the green, the value chain, which hasn't quite caught up yet, and the acquisitions and partnerships, which are too many to count, we're looking at a different world. And I think it's gonna come along much, much faster than a lot of folks that are sitting in um, basically very high offices inside of the OEMs. It's gonna come along a lot faster than they anticipated. The COVID, financial woes has really, really changed the way people are thinking about product. So we're looking at conclusions now and we're saying EVs are here to stay and they're growing, but you better be ready with a very, very fat wallet because there's lots of investment costs. If you wanna get into today's market, you better have deep pockets. And quite frankly, again, I look at all of the OEMs that are out there I'm very nervous that um, they've spent too much time thinking that somehow their supply community will take care of them. They've been spending too much time thinking about how do I, how do I maintain my, uh, my ICE uh, assets? Sometimes, um, <clears throat> sometimes people need to think of it in a different way. If you're on board a ship, you have an anchor, 
And if you get into a storm, you can toss that anchor overboard. The anchor will hold you in place and keep you from uh, swamping the ship. It's a good thing. However, if the ship starts to sink, you probably don't want to hang on to the anchor. It probably won't help, it won't, it won't help you, I guarantee it. So what we have to do is we have to look at <clears throat> what are the anchors associated with our industry or our products or our company. We're going to have to find out what it is that we want to keep and what, are the, what it is that we just have to abandon. And I think that this is going to be the biggest challenge that all OEMs around the world are going to have to look at. They're going to have to look at what do we do with all these engine plants? What do we do with all of the technology and whatnot that we've got invested in the ICE world? What are we going to do with our, with our sales teams and our, and our dealerships and whatnot? How are we going to make these things happen if we're going to have to compete against somebody like Tesla? That's the first thing that I think we're going to have to look at. So they're going to have to, all car companies are going to look at the architectures that are being changed daily by Tesla. Investments, how are we going to make those investments? The technologies that are out there, how much in technology do we need to invest in our own companies versus buying it from someone else? And when you buy a technology and you don't have any profound knowledge, how, how are you going to compete in the future? And then the raw materials that we're going to need. How are we going to try and do what we need to do in order to make things right? And the last one, of course, is infrastructure. I have a couple of little words of wisdom for everyone. It's not the big that eat the small. It's the fast that eat the slow. That leopard that you're looking, or cheetah, or whatever he is, he's looking for something to eat. And I think that, uh, I think that big cat, I think his name is Tesla. If you're not investigating Tesla, you better be. If you don't know everything about Tesla, you better find out. Because you don't want to get stuck in the ice age. So I hope that what I've talked to you today about will, uh, will add to your source of knowledge. And with that, I'd like to thank you and bid you a good day. Thank you so much. Thank you.